would you please help me welcome Steve Ramsey to the show? Hey, Mr. Steve, how are you? Hey, great. Thank you for that introduction. It's, it's nice to be on the show, R2. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, yeah. We're thrilled to have you. I, I appreciate you agreeing to uh, to be here, and I appreciate you letting me call you Steve. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what else would you call me? Right? <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, you are... You have one of the most approachable, relatable uh, woodworking channels online, and you've been doing it over a decade now. Yeah, um, 14 years. 14. Okay. <laughs> At, <laughs> well, I'm going to get started with questions if that's okay with you. Yeah. Um, at what point did, did you say, I'm going to do this full time? This is going to be what I do. I'm going to, I'm going to be a, you, I'm going to be a woodworker slash YouTube video creator. Yeah. It, it's, I think my story is different than a lot of people. A lot of people today seem to have a, a definite date. They're like, that's it. I'm quitting the day job and I'm going over to YouTube. But with me, it was back in 2008 when I posted my first YouTube video and I still had my design business, graphic designer, and I was doing uh, custom work for mostly printed materials and some online work. But 2008 was not really a good time for the economy. And a lot of my clients were either closing up shop or they were starting to try to take on some of that design work in-house. And so it was a good opportunity for me to just start posting things on YouTube in my free time and still doing the design work. But eventually the design work became less and less and the time I was spending making YouTube videos was getting more and more. And then it was right around, I guess maybe 2010 or so after, and you, it took a while for YouTube to kind of start to monetize their stuff, but I was actually able to start making more money on YouTube than I was in my dwindling graphic design business. So I, I don't think there was ever really a date. There was actually, a, I actually had one client I kept working for like a few years after I was still, you know, I considered myself a full-time YouTuber. So it was a really gradual transition into the job. Well, it, it seems like a natural fit, but I know a lot of work uh, went into this. And unlike the thousands of woodworking YouTube channels out there today, um, they're, they're, it was a different environment at that time. So you really leaned on knowledge you had gained previously. And in seeing some of your other interviews, uh, you had been doing woodwork most of your life, right? Yeah, I started woodworking when I was probably 10 or 11. I remember 12 woodworking quite a bit on my dad's shopsmith. Are you, are you familiar with a shopsmith? It's oh, a, yes. Yeah, it's an all-in-one tool. It's kind of crazy, really. I can't imagine working on a shopsmith today because you, 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 it has a table saw. And then, you know, if you want to switch to like a drill press, you got to like change it around. And so the kind of the workflow left a little bit to be desired. But I actually started, I was really fascinated by the lathe. And so I would turn a lot of candlesticks and lamps and things and give away as gifts. And that sort of was my, my entry point into woodworking. And so then I've been doing woodworking you know, over 40 years and uh, doing it in all sorts of different ways and styles. And it, it just has never, and it's always just been a part of my life. Yeah. My growth rings is a channel that's commenting because his channel is primarily based around the shopsmith and he's very educated on it. And it's a, it's a great machine, but it's very different than uh, the setup you have or, or I haven't, or many of our, our viewers have, but I remember those infomercials like in the eighties yeah. <laughs> about the uh, Shopsmith Mark yeah. five, I believe. Yeah. the Mar I think they still make the Mark five. I'm sure my growth rings would know better than me, but I, I feel, I still think they, they're still doing the same, same Shopsmith. I should, I'm going to have to check out my growth rings channel because I think it's pretty cool that somebody does that. Yeah. He, he gets, uh, he gets really in depth about it and, and shows all the details. It, it's it's really a neat machine, and it's uh, neat how he explains the evolution of Shopsmith, how they they updated it as they went along, um, different features to to make it more user friendly. So um, 
I always thought it was a, an interesting concept. Yeah, it's like a, it's a Swiss Army knife of power tools. It's got everything. It's a perfect tool for a small space, you know. It really, and if you're if you're not in any kind of a hurry or anything, why not? You know, I think that to me that would be the only frustrating thing is that after you, you kind of have to plan your project out a little bit better because from switching from tool to tool, you can't just go back to one. Yeah, he says it's the Mark Seven now. Is it? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I guess I'm two marks off. Yeah. So, um, fourteen years of doing this, uh, the platform has definitely changed over time um, and continues to evolve. And I kind of geared the thumbnail for this live stream uh, based on that. Uh, <laughs> I love I love that thumbnail, by the way. <laughs> Adapt or die. It has such an urgency to it. <laughs> well, I'm, and, I'm a big and fan I, of thumbnails. I really am like. I, I added the YouTube face, you know, yeah. so the, <laughs> the over exaggerated reaction. YouTube and, scream face. Yeah. Yeah. So um, as you've seen it, have you, as you have seen the platform change, how has that given you inspiration and, and what adjustments did you? you make along the way? I know you can't cover 14 years of adjustment, <laughs> but even in the past couple of years, I've seen yeah. you make adjustments. And just when others would say, okay, you've done it all. You've, you've made every video about every subject. You find a new and innovative way to present the information. And I think, uh, I think our viewers would like some more insight on how you, how you did that along the way. Yeah, I think the history of YouTube is just the history of change and evolution. And the people who do well on YouTube in the long run are people who are willing to play by YouTube's game. You can be real, you know, dig in your heels and say, I'm going to make my kind of YouTube video exactly the way I've always done it. But you won't continue to grow the way you can if you look at what YouTube is doing and you adapt. Your thumbnail was pretty on point, really. You do, and over the years, I've, I've found myself doing that. When I first started in YouTube, short was the name of the game. You had to have, uh, not shorts, but a short. You had to have maybe three, four minute videos were like the prime spot that you wanted them to get viewers and eventually that kind of changed and various features came on and we could we could try those and they would fade away new things come on and i think it's just all about trying those new features when they come up and seeing if it works it, i think a lot of youtubers are a little bit afraid to try the new stuff they're afraid of what will happen what will my channel just die if i if i post a short or if i do a live stream or if i post a, a, a stories does anybody still use stories <laughs> by, <laughs> by the way um there's, there's all these different things you could do and then sometimes it, it you'll find videos that are kind of dated like they used to have a feature called annotations uh, which was really cool like, that's the one thing i wish they would bring back where you could add notes in your videos along the way. And it was real handy if you like screwed something up or somebody called out like, oh, you said this wrong. Then you could just put a little note in your video that says, I got this wrong and arrow to it. Or, and they eliminated that feature. But now if you look back at some old videos that used those, <laughs> people are pointing to all the sorts of stuff that just doesn't exist. You know, like, click here, click here. I had a video like 2009, maybe early video of mine where it was name that power tool. And it was just like a, it was like choose your own adventure kind of thing. And so you would listen to the sound of a different power tool. And then you'd have to guess what that power tool was, whether it was, you know, a bandsaw, a table saw or whatever. I think most woodworkers could probably easily <laughs> figure that out, but some of them were a little tricky. But now that whole video and that whole, all that effort I, I put into that whole series of videos is just dead <laughs> because they eliminated the annotations feature. But Kind of went off on a tangent there, but yeah, uh, <laughs> it's adapt or die. You're right. <laughs> so one of the things that you've done great at is the uh, YouTube shorts. Um, and, and you really ran with that um, and produced some some great shorts. Do you have a secret formula uh, to get good results on the shorts? Yeah, controversy. Contro <laughs> make some sort of controversy, but it, it's never any controversy that I plan. It's just things happen 
And you never know what people are going to latch on to that, that causes this engagement in the comments and people will find one thing. And it, it, here's an example. The most recent kind of successful short that I've done is uh, why does a tape measure have the little, or why is the, the hook on the end of a tape measure kind of loose, you know? And it is a very good reason. It's supposed to be that way, but in the video I mentioned that it was a, it's a 16th of an inch play in that. And so like half of the comments are from people in other countries who use the metric system, like the rest of the world, who just are like, this is so stupid, just switch to metric. I mean, it just eats at them that I, I use the imperial system of measurement. But for some reason, that's the thing that they really keyed into on that video. And so I guess YouTube just likes all of those comments. YouTube, and you can never predict that stuff. I would have never in a million years predicted that, oh, this is the one thing that people are going to latch on to. But here we are. Yeah. And, and I do like doing the shorts, by the way. And I think that it's a good feature that they've implemented. I'm curious where it's going to go. I think a lot of people kind of have a wrong idea about it. And I think a lot of YouTubers were afraid to do it thinking it's just TikTok and it's it's not because it's made by YouTubers and it's a whole different kind of mentality of what a video is. And I personally see them as an interesting challenge, especially after 14 years of doing this stuff that there's like, okay, now I've got constraints to work in. I have to shoot a vertical video. It has to be 60 seconds or shorter. How can I convey a bit of inst interesting information in that? period of time. So I, I very carefully write up a script. I try to make it 150 words and then um, shoot it all, refine it, make sure I got that editing right and post it. And sometimes they, they hit and sometimes they don't. And it can take a couple of weeks before they hit. The, the first week or so after posting a short is just like flatline, nothing. And then all of a sudden YouTube catches it and it runs and then other times it doesn't. So I don't know. I just think it's, I think people should not hesitate to try. I think that was the big worry people had was that it was going to just ruin the rest of your content. If you just do shorts on your channel, and I think it's just part of a content mix. It can, it can work in there really well, just like, just like live streams or anything else. Yeah. It's uh it's a definitely a different kind of uh, format with the vertical and the time limitations, um, but it reaches a, a different audience uh, sometimes. And sometimes it's the same audience who occasionally watches uh, YouTube shorts. I know, I mean, I, I go watch some YouTube shorts occasionally, uh, but I'm not a TikTok person. I don't want shorts like that all the time. I want to see some longer content. And I right. think if you have a successful short, you can find people like me, except the ones that haven't discovered your channel yet. And that might be um, some some new uh, some new people for your channel, subscribers. Yeah, that, I, I think that's kind of followers. the followers. That's kind of the main thing. I mean, most of the people watching YouTube Shorts are not subscribers at all. Most of the people are non-subscribers. So I just feel like that's you know, a way for them to possibly discover my channel. If only, you know, 1% of those people decides to look at the rest of my videos and then a fraction of those is interested in watching the longer videos, then maybe they might see, you know, a plug for one of my courses or something. And then maybe a fraction of those people might buy a course. So ultimately all of these things might lead to a sale, something you just never know. And I think it's, it's worth trying. And I also think that there's some topics that just they don't need more than a minute i think that like the hook on the end of, the t of a tape measure is a perfect example of something that how am i going to stretch this out to two or three minutes even when i i can just tell you it's there for a reason it's so you can measure inside and outside and it's equal and blah there you go in 60 seconds i can explain it and it's perfect the only thing that is a little annoying is the, is the vertical format but you know again 99 percent of all those views are on phones you know, people watching that stuff. So it kind of makes sense there. Yeah. And as far as monetization, nah. there is a, there is a program, no. but, but you're not going to get rich off of short. Yeah. I get like a hundred dollars a month off of their, you, their shorts, uh, fund, I guess they call it. And it, you do get a little bit of AdSense in that first little bit, 
where it's because I think that if you watch it on a desktop, it still works under the AdSense system, but not a lot of people want to watch those on a desktop or laptop computer, you know? Yeah. I, I wish they would separate it away. So it, it was like not really showing up in those desktop feeds. Yeah. I wish they would separate it on the, in the YouTube studio. So all the stats would completely be separate because, yeah. you know, it kind of skews the average, um, average play time and, and watch time and so are forth. You, are you an analytics guy, RT? Do you spend a lot of time looking at analytics? I, I've probably spent too much time looking at the analytics. <laughs> you got to drive yourself crazy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's your, how much time do you spend on analytics? Yeah, it, it's again, this is one of those things that's kind of fluctuated over the years. Sometimes I'm really into it and other times I'm not. And there was a time when I was just like pouring myself into it and doing all of the, you know, you can group the videos and test those. And, and now I basically look at the first page and I glance at it and see how the views and, and, you know, click through rates are and stuff and how much CPMs I'm getting, how much they're dwindling. <laughs> and I like to look at like which video, the, like the main thing I look at is like this video is number nine out of your past 10 or something. And those things always kind of annoy me a little bit, but I can't help myself. Yeah, those are, uh, what, what really gets me is the teaser ones that show up like number one for the first few hours and then, and then it drops and then <laughs> drop. you get the confetti, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, um, yeah. in Lincoln street woodwork says lay analytics for the win. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. I, I don't know. It, it, this is an interesting topic about how to use analytics and if they really do much good, because I've talked to people, I have a podcast where I talk to creators from all different channels, not, not just woodworking channels and stuff. And, like some of them are really keyed in and spend a lot of time on analytics. And then there's some people who have really big channels who just never look at analytics. And I think a lot of it just comes down to intuition. And I also kind of think analytics are more important when you're a new channel, when you're just kind of starting out to kind of give you more of an idea of what audiences are responding to. But, at, you know, I think if I get a clunker video, I usually know, <laughs> I kind of know why it's that way. But I also kind of think there's some of the analytics they give you is like, when, when do people drop out of your videos? And what did you say at that exact moment? But I've never really put any of that into practice because it, other than the obvious things like, well, that's the end of the video. And then that's when people leave, you know. But other times, you know, you, you start to see the trends go down and I kind of think, I, I don't know, am I really going to change anything based on that? I think I will. But when it comes into practice, I, I just don't. So I, I don't know. Yeah, it's it's always a uh, challenge to look at your old videos, figure out where things went wrong. But you can't go back in time and remake that one. That one's out there. So yeah. so now how are you going to apply that knowledge to to future ones? I think the best thing to do is with older videos is play around with thumbnails and titles. I think that is the, especially thumbnails. That's like the main way people watch your videos is just, you have a good thumbnail, they're going to click on it and watch it. And yeah, you have a millisecond to impress them with that thumbnail and they're moving on. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. true. It, it really is. And so that's why everybody's, you know, playing the thumbnail game, trying to really ratchet it up and figure out what works and that's why you see a lot of that youtube scream face but i think that's kind of getting overdone don't you don't you <laughs> yeah I, I think people are getting burned out on the on yeah the, YouTube the scream face. Uh -huh. yeah um the, the extreme emotions that you're trying to portray in a, in a thumbnail yeah uh people are people are used to it now and they, they expect it to be clickbait at that point really yeah um how about the pandemic i know you did us all a favor by going into uh super active mode releasing yeah. videos but how did the pandemic uh, affect your channel overall did you see an increase in subscribers oh, huge, and huge increase yeah it was the, and i think a lot of channels especially new channels the pandemic as horrible as it is and was is was a great opportunity and if the channels who didn't really see those increases are the ones who just kept doing the exact same thing. But when there's a huge change happening in the world, you need to be able to change 
with it. And I, there was no way I was going to be able to sustain a daily show forever. But I didn't think it was it was going to drag on as long as it did. So, you know, after a year or so of doing that, I was like, this is phew, there's no way I could do that. Even on the first video I posted on that, I said, I don't think this is sustainable, but do it because this, come along with me on this because this has helped keeping me sane just to do this daily show and just to talk to a screen of people. And it was really cool. It was it was something that was really special. It was that was, you know, that period of time in my YouTube channel is like one of the highlights for me uh, thinking back on it. And even then, eventually over that course of that year, the views started to dwindle on that. So people do get really interested in, in things and then they start to go down. And that's when you need to try something new and just throw it out there. Don't be afraid to just, yeah, try anything new. Yeah, so you've uh, you've definitely made an impact on thousands. I don't know how many thousand. I, I doubt you know exactly how many thousand uh, that your videos have influenced and educated in the woodworking community. Um, as you reflect on that, um, do, has that knowledge, knowing that what you've done already, influencing so many, influenced your decisions for the future? Uh, in some ways, yeah, it's definitely made me more humble because I'm very aware of that. I hear from people all the time and, and I never considered myself, you know, a kind of guy who's going to change people's lives. This was certainly never the intention of the channel when I started it. I was just posting things I was making. I just thought that was a fun thing to do. But over time, as I started to hear more and more of that, I started to understand that what I was doing came with... A responsibility and I just want to make sure that what I'm doing now is staying true to the whole concept of woodworking for mere mortals and still being an advocate for people with small shops without a lot of tools expensive tools and with and for the beginning of woodworker I think that that's a niche that is serving me well and I, I always try to frame everything around that yeah have you ever thought, okay, I'm at the point I'd like to buy a huge CNC and yeah. laser, but then thought, well, yeah. this really doesn't serve the audience I've, I've, I've targeted all this time. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I would love to have a CNC. I, for one, I don't really have room for a very big CNC. I would love to have like a laser cutter and uh, a lot of these things I think would be real fun to play with, but Again, I have to keep coming back to my mission is to educate beginning woodworkers and using tools that most people have access to and can afford. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it's a little bit of a double edged sword there about what I really want to try, but what I need to do for the show and for the audience, and for the people watching. You know, but it, at one time, a table saw would not have been considered something for the beginning woodworker. And, you know, times change and that became a mainstream woodworking sure. tool. CNC and laser cutters are rapidly becoming more and more common. You, you ever think you'll uh, consider making that leap? Maybe. I mean, it could happen. It's just kind of, I guess I would just have to kind of, I, I don't get the sense right now that we're at that point of kind of general widespread acceptance, the way people would compare a CNC with a table saw. Right now, table saw is kind of, everybody considers that, yeah, that's fine. You can buy a table saw for three, $400 and do some work on it. Whereas a CNC still has that extra barrier of entry, especially for just the, um, computer work involved in it. So it's it's less uh, strictly hands on in involving this extra step to it. But I yeah, you're right, it could possibly get to that point. So, and then I would jump on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I know there's there's you have a way to download a list of tools that a beginner can obtain for less than a $1,000 and start their woodworking journey. Um, have you tracked how many of those have been downloaded over time? 
Uh, yeah, I, I don't really know what those numbers are right now, but okay. it's it's probably close to a million, I would guess. It's a lot. And it does really well. That that list is, is something that I'm actually kind of proud of. It started as, it, it's actually, to tell you the truth, it's get, beginning to get to be more and more of a challenge to keep that under $1,000. Um, cause you know, prices go up and every month we, we have to update it, make sure that everything is still valid on there and the tools change their model numbers. And it's, it's crazy the way these tool companies are constantly, constantly changing and upgrading. And you think, what did you do? It looks exactly the same. I don't know. We <laughs> made a different color switch or something. Yeah. Small changes, uh, cause a new release. Yeah. Well, um, start with some of the viewer questions of all the social media platforms which do you enjoy producing content for the most youtube i mean that's really what i'm here for although i gotta say that uh i started recently posting uh reels on instagram because i've had an instagram forever you know but i've always just posted pictures on there and it was just sitting at around, I don't know, 60,000 followers or something. I never gave it much thought, but about a month and a half ago, I started posting those reels and that's phew, it just sent it into the stratosphere. Well, for me, it's like a hundred thousand followers on there, which that curve just jumped dramatically. I think the future of everything is short form video content. Every platform is really doubling down on that. Yeah. It it really makes sense because whenever you watch a reel, if it was any good, you're hoping the next one will be at least that good and you stay on their platform. Yeah. Um, and I, I know, you know, I expect that that's their goal is keep you on their platform. Well, that's exactly it. it. <laughs> and see, yeah. this is why YouTube isn't so concerned with subscribers anymore. It used to be a subscriber was kind of a big thing. You wanted to have subscribers because they were the ones who would watch your videos. But YouTube realized, wait a second, people would be going to the subscriber feed, watching their subscriber videos, and then just leaving the platform. And they're like, no, we'd rather have people staying on the platform. And so they've kind of, they've kind of downplayed that whole subscriber model. Yeah. And it's, it's really interesting to me how YouTube, you know, if you get a viewer to watch one of your videos, they're going to show them more of your videos to, within a day to see if they like more of your content, whether they subscribe or not. Yeah. And they'll, they'll keep showing them that content if they keep looking at it. I mean, you know, my daughter got a hold of my phone and then next day I'm looking at some <laughs> yeah, you know, know. thing about Roblox. So <laughs> I think that people subscribe as more of just a like, you know, a yeah. thumbs up more than anything today. Yeah, and subscribers, you know, to me are, aren't as the number isn't as important. It's the people behind the numbers. But after you get to a thousand and you can be monetized, then it, the urgency to get them to subscribe is not as important as making sure that they have the content that they need and will enjoy what you're offering, so they'll come back. Yeah, um, I mean, it's it's a vanity number for the most part. It's sure, definitely. Um, Mackenzie Lumbermill, Sandy over there says, Hi, Steve. What advice would you give a new YouTuber to be competitive and relevant? I bring the audience of a sawmill life journey. Ah, I think that there's the, the main thing about succeeding on YouTube is being personality driven. I think that's really the most important thing. I have a, I do this woodworking talk show podcast. And I keep this list, I maintain a list of woodworking and maker channels. And you know, it's just hundreds and hundreds of them there. And I'm always looking through who would I like to invite on the show. And the really the only criteria I don't care about subscribers or view counts is that you're doing something interesting, because there's all these hundreds of other people. What are you doing that's different than these other people? And can you talk? <laughs> because for for my podcast, that's that's the most important thing. I had a guy, real nice guy, recently emailed me and asked me. He recommended a channel, and I love the channel, but it's one of these hands channels. You only see the guy's hands, and you don't hear him talk. And I think, yeah, that's great, but it's going to be really hard for me to have a conversation with him. More than likely, that's going to be a really difficult interview. 
And so I think that that applies to just any YouTube channel is that people are mostly watching your channel for you. And so you, you got to remember that it's, it is about you. you. You do have to have a little bit of an ego. You don't have to worry. Um, don't be shy. Don't be humble. <laughs> Tell people who you are, why they should watch you, what you're doing that's different. Yeah, I don't worry about Sandy being shy. She's uh, she's outgoing and and bubbly, and uh, she's got a great channel going on. So I think that's uh, great. I think she's going to do very well. R. H. Harley guy says, Steve, do not under any circumstances stop doing your interview podcast. Oh. Every Friday, I hear that music it saves me. <laughs> what advice would you give someone just starting out? I think what I, I just uh, gave was, yeah, just personality based. Do That's what people are watch videos for. They really, really do. You can make, you could be an amazing woodworker or, or maker. And unless you've got some sort of an engaging personality, um, people just won't watch and you can work on it. You can work on that. I think my original video, I think it was just, they were so crappy. But I, I worked on it over time to try to, I don't know, maintain that relationship a little bit better with the camera and try to, I always try to think of who's watching. I try to like have a person in my mind that I'm just actually speaking to and, and that sort of helps. Yeah, the, uh, the commonly referred to avatar now. <laughs> Yeah, the, the avatar, the exactly. Oh, and by the way, R. A. Charlie, thank you for, uh, for your comment about my podcast. I really appreciate that. It's one of the things on podcasts, you don't get a whole lot of feedback. So it's really nice to hear that. Yeah, they're really good. Uh, do you have a separate workshop with fancier equipment that you use <laughs> on your personal life? <laughs> <laughs> I'm keeping it out back. <laughs> no, this is it. This is where I spend my time and I live is a small garage. Uh, you're so busy making content. I don't know when you'd have time for a second garage. Yeah. For <laughs> a second shot. Uh, Simon's funny, though. All right. McMath Woodworks says, hey, Steve, have you ever been about to post a video and have someone else beat you to almost the same idea? Uh, it's uh, it's happened before. Yeah. that And it's happened before where I've made a project that somebody else has made and um, didn't realize it. I had early on I, I made a. Uh, this is also early YouTube. I made a clock and it was almost identical to one that Mark Spagnolo made over on the Wood Whisperer. We were about the only guys on YouTube back then. But honestly, I'd never seen it before. And actually, you know, the, the thing I wouldn't be, I, he wasn't upset because he knows I didn't copy him. But I always think if somebody makes a project that's similar to mine, I'm really not upset about that. It's like, I'm, I'm kind of upset that they probably didn't, haven't been watching my videos. <laughs> Because if they had, they probably wouldn't have done that. Yeah, that's that's good. Um, that kind of leads me to something I wanted to ask you. I'm going to share something here and tell you about something and ask you about it. Talk about a controversy. Um, Ooh. This has been the topic of some comments on my channel and a couple of emails. Um, so let's see if I can share this. So if you look at my logo, I've been accused of copying your logo. Hey, you're missing a W. <laughs> and they, um, one person was uh, pretty nasty about it. everybody else is just like, Hey, did you, uh, did you copy Steve's logo whenever you decided to do your channel? It's two M's, and actually, that's a uh, contractor's well, ruler that made into a W. Um, so I wanted to ask you, do you feel like I copied your logo? <laughs> no, see, yours is actually proper because you have woodworking as one W. See, <laughs> I have woodworking. Just for symmetry, I had WWMM, woodworking for mere mortals. But the it doesn't really make sense to have two W's, right? I mean, woodworking is just <laughs> one word. But no, it doesn't bother me. It looks yeah, good. I, uh, I like it. I, I've told them that, you know, I love your logo, but it's 
you know, it's, it's letters for me. It was just letters. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, yours, the symmetry makes the diamonds in between mm -hmm. the, the arches of the uh, letters. And I told them yours is, is genius. And um, they, they didn't like my response anyway. Uh, uh, you yeah, ever I get a, you ever get negative comments, Steve? Oh, sure. Yeah, I get negative comments all the time, <laughs> especially on shorts. Start doing shorts. You get some negative comments. <laughs> yeah. No, we all do. It doesn't bother me. I don't I don't care. It's engagement. People like to, you know, I, I'm like so over all of that. There's there was times where they would like kind of bother me a little bit more, but it's easy to get kind of roped into that. And you, you start to just get into a bad space with, with comments. But, you know, it's. It, I, I have a privileged job. I can't complain about comments. You know, there's guys who really have to work for a living. And here I'm not in any position to go, oh, somebody said something mean on a video I made. <laughs> yeah, I was, I'm mainly just joking because I, I didn't, I knew you wouldn't have a, I, oh, no, I thought I mean, if you, I know you're subscribed to my channel, so I appreciate that. But if you thought there was something uh, wrong, you would have contacted me. Oh, no, um, I, I never even really considered that at all. <laughs> no, it's a totally different logo. Yours is linear. Yeah. MMW. So 4321 Woodworking. Chris says, I loved your lockdown woodworking during pandemic. Look forward to it every day. So uh -huh. thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. Thank you for watching that. That was really a God. What a bizarre time that was. Whew. I just, it just felt like an entire year of like, I'm just making videos. I'm not speaking to anybody. I'm not seeing anybody. I'm just like, the, I was literally, it felt like the only thing I was doing was talking to an audience. If I didn't have the audience there, I feel like, I don't know. I don't know what I would have done. It was just crazy. Ugh. Yeah. 15 days, right? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. I remember starting that. I think, well, yeah, I can probably continue this for a few weeks or something. <laughs> Uh, finally seeing my favorite interview YouTuber interviewing my favorite YouTube interviewer. Um, this is amazing and nostalgic. Uh -huh. You hit the big time RT. Congrats to you both. Uh, yeah. Love okay. you, brother. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm at that stage where I become nostalgic, though, too, you know. Yeah. So, like, I uh, remember you. Once in a while, I'll get comments from somebody on a video, and they're like, hey, I remember you watching you like 10 years ago. I didn't know you were still around. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, R.A. Charlie, guys, great. Always has good comments here. Um, and you, have a, you have a great community here, don't you? I, I've watched a couple of your live streams before. You really got a nice, tight-knit group of people here. That's great. Well, thank you. Yeah, they're great people. Um, I find, in general, the, the woodworking community is, is made up of great, generous people yeah. who are very supportive of each other. Um, and, you know, occasionally you find one that's having a bad day, but, you know, for the most part, fantastic people. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think that's one of the best things about YouTube is it, it's brought a lot of these. And now there's like in communities within communities that have kind of sprung up within woodworking and maker community. And I think that's really one of the best things about YouTube is that aspect of it. Yeah, it, uh, you know, growing up, before the internet, um, you know, I used to like go to the library and see if they had any new woodworking books. You yeah, know? me too. And, and I really enjoyed shop class in school because there wasn't a lot of people around to share that knowledge. Now you go online and there's people everywhere willing to share knowledge and from all the way around the world. And I think it's fantastic. And we have, we have viewers commonly on this um, channel uh, from Canada, the UK, um, and, and other places. So we are great. I, I appreciate everybody watching, and um, I think it's great that everybody can support each other globally. Lincoln Street Woodworks, who uh, is over 100,000 subscribers now and started out about a year ago or less than a year ago. Do you find the subscriber conversion ratio lower on shorts? Um no, I find it's higher. There, it, I've, it dip, well, I'm not sure what the actual ratio is, to, to be honest with you. But I know that on, I have one video that 
it, one short alone that has converted like 15,000 subscribers, which was quite a bit, you know, usually when I post a regular video, I lose subscribers. So it's, I think, <laughs> and I think everybody does that because it's when it comes through somebody's feed and they're like, oh yeah, I remember that guy and I don't need to subscribe anymore. It's a reminder of the pain I'm inflicting on people. But <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Lincoln Street Woodworks, by the way, I think that's amazing. 100,000 in less than a year. That's a success story. And I, I was actually looking at your channel and some funny stuff on there. I'm going to have to have you on my podcast. That, I think that was pretty cool. I think that um, there's a lot to talk about there. Real success. Yeah. John, be good on your... Uh on your podcast. He's been on here a couple of times. He's, uh, he's witty and obviously he knows how to do this YouTube thing. Yeah. Yeah. Some people just have that secret sauce and it just works. You know, I think a lot, it kind of, especially during 2020, there were a lot of brand new channels that cropped up and you, you could see some of those just went straight to the top. Others, not so much, but yeah. All right, make with Jake. Jake says, been a fan since forever. How much time do you spend planning your videos before you head to the shop? Uh, I do a fair amount of planning for all of my videos. I don't do a whole lot of project based videos anymore. But when I'm building something, I definitely plan out everything. Uh, I'm a real believer in having a good set of plans. So I will eat no matter how small say a simple box that I want to make, I will literally design that in SketchUp so that I know exactly the proportions and that I know how, what size I want to cut each board. I take my own plans right into my shop so I can just boom, 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 follow them step by step. And I really think that planning is important. I'm not a good just wing it kind of guy. I, I end up just sitting around too much looking at things and not really getting much accomplished. So. I do believe that SketchUp is probably one of the most important skills any woodworker can learn or Fusion 360. Yeah, and uh, I've uh, seen some of your, especially you had some older videos where you showed some basics of SketchUp and I think that's, uh, that's great. I need to learn it. Um, R.A. Charlie Guy says, Hey, Steve, I never get tired of listening to the podcast between your personality, soothing voice, and the way you put it together. What do you use to edit your videos and podcast? I had just recently, in the, within the last year or so, switched to Adobe Premiere to edit videos. And I was using a Sony Vegas for years. And I just, there were some things I wanted to accomplish with that I couldn't do in there. So I, I finally made the leap to Premiere and I'm glad I did because it's it's a much more powerful program. I love it. I really just love it and I'm getting real fast with it. And so I like the whole kind of Adobe suite of products because I've used, well, Photoshop since 1995 <laughs> and Illustrator and all those, so they all work really well together. And then for editing audio, I use Adobe Audition, which, I also just love editing audio. Then that's something new since I started the podcasts um, almost almost two years ago, I guess, I, the first podcast. And it's such a blast to edit audio because you can edit out the slightest little ums and, and clicks and weird noises and things that you can't do in video. I mean, you could, but it would be a really choppy video. So I, I really like doing the audio. And it's, it's pretty fast editing audio. I enjoy it a lot. Awesome. My Growth Rings says, how often does Steve swap or consider swapping a thumbnail? Yeah, so for a while I was using this TubeBuddy thing. You, you're probably familiar with that where mm -hmm. you can, they do it. And I, I kind of got really involved in that and went through a bunch of older videos swapping them out. But I, I don't... I don't know how effective it is because that tube buddy only swaps them out every 24 hours. So I, I don't think that really gives you much to go on, maybe on some older videos. But so I try to just stick with my first gut instinct, unless I know it's a really good video. And I'm like, why aren't people watching this? Then I might try a different thumbnail. But 
these days I just try to go with my gut. I, today I've been spending a lot of time on a thumbnail because I, I shot this video that I think is going to be really, really fun. I did this uh, testing tape measures. To, I don't know why I become like this tape measure channel. <laughs> I don't know. See, these things just evolve. But I wanted to test if snapping a tape measure back, you know, they say, don't ever let it back. It'll ruin it. And so I wanted to test to see if that was true. So I, I snapped it 10,000 times <laughs> over the course of 16 days. Uh, and so I think this is going to be a really fun video. I had a lot of fun editing it. But now I'm just stuck on the, the thumbnails. I know I got two and I, I sent them to like my friend Chad, who I do the podcast with, and, and we're like going over them. And it's just, it's very difficult to decide a good thumbnail. I think that you have to kind of be clickbait to a certain extent. You have to know at what point to take that without going over the edge into the abyss of, <laughs> I hate this channel now. So I don't know. It's kind of a yeah, game. That that good clickbait versus bad clickbait. Good clickbait yeah. being kind of on that edge, right? Being kind of extreme, but you still yeah. deliver the content in the video. Uh, bad clickbait, just obviously misleading the uh, the viewer. Yeah, and you don't really see a whole lot of bad, that kind of clickbait anymore. It used to be, you know, common, but YouTube really reeled that in and they got a pretty good hook on that. And I think their algorithm pretty much spots those really egregious clickbait and i think that right now you can pretty much do anything on a thumbnail and people will accept it as long as it's well pretty much anything <laughs> i think you could just it's just my my personal taste i have to kind of i don't have the guts to really really go for the clickbait but i, it, I really wish there. i really wish youtube would make it where you could upload two or three thumbnails and they would yeah. automatically test it randomly. Yes. And, and, and be, and just use the better one after a certain amount of time. Uh, they have access to all the stats and could control it better than TubeBuddy or vidIQ or any other third party company. Yeah. So I was, I was talking to Laura Kampf last week on my show and I asked her a similar question about thumbnails and her take was, no, I'm not going to second guess myself. I'm going to make a thumbnail. I'm going to put it on there and just stand by my decision. I don't want to be in the position of always having to second guess myself and, and try all these different thumbnails. And I thought, wow, that's, that's pretty wise. I kind of like that idea. Yeah. Let's uh, go to the next question. Again, Sandy from McKenzie Lumber Mill. I am addicted to analytics, even though I don't have any yet. Do you ever wish your shorts are on a separate channel and why? Yeah, that's a big decision. I think a lot of people, especially early on, were trying to make is do you start a separate channel or keep the shorts on your main channel? And I never even considered the second channel. I just think that <clears throat> all of my content needs to go where I am. And I kind of see, I'd like to see channels evolve into more of like a channel, like we're traditional, like TV channel where you, you have a channel, but there's different shows within that channel. And, you know, you could have the segment for your shorts or your live streams and your, your longs, you know, all these different things and people can kind of just pick and choose what they want to watch. I don't see any harm in posting shorts on, on the main channel at all. Um, I, I chose to start a separate channel for the live streams because this is really geared towards different kind of content than my woodworking channel. You know, this, we talk a lot about YouTube here and, you know, I wanted to be able to, to separate the two and have the live stream separate. But the, the shorts, if one of the main purposes of engineering shorts is to get subscribers, it's hard enough to get them to subscribe, but then to have them switch channels. Um, that would just add additional. Um, yeah, it's hard I, to get I don't people to click to a different click away to a different channel. Or it's like, well, now you got to go here if you want to watch this content. Now you got to go here if you want to watch this content. But I, I think you're right on the live streams, though. If it's a totally different content, you know, 
I would definitely put it on, on a separate channel. I have a separate channel just for things like that that I just dump on there. Uh, my growth ring says, has Steve watched any episodes of Making Fun? And if so, what does he think of it? Will it open doors for other makers? Uh, yeah, actually, I, I was just talking to Jimmy Duresta this morning for my podcast. It'll be on this Friday's episode to talk to him about that show. And so I watched a couple episodes of it and it's it's real cute. I mean, it's real fun. I think kids will enjoy it a lot. I think that the, the biggest question people have about this sort of thing is why television? Because you can reach a lot more people on YouTube than you can on TV in a lot of these situations, especially on somebody like Duresta can probably reach way more people if he did that on the YouTube channel. But with the Netflix show, he has much bigger production surrounding it. So he's got, you know, 30 people on the set and this sort of production company is handling all that. And so it produces a much more glossy finished product, which I think it looks great. I think it's funny. I think it's, I think it's doing well. I'm sure I have no doubt that they'll do a second, a second season of that. And, yeah. you know, we got to meet Jimmy and his team at uh, workbench con and I just can't imagine anything those guys couldn't accomplish with that show. Yeah. Yeah. So, very, yeah it's a lot of good. fun. I think that it's a good way for kids to see things being made that aren't just the corny things that they have to make in school, you know, on <laughs> the really safe project. They get to see actual projects being made and they're fun. Chris over at 432 Woodworking says, how are Bubbles and Cobra Aww. doing? <laughs> Bubbles and Cobra are doing great. And yes, they love the catwalk, the catification. Oh my God, they go crazy. So Cobra and Bubbles are our cats, if you, if you didn't know that. So I built during the during the uh, lockdown woodworking series, I built this uh, series of ramps and little, like a tree. I made a cat tree out of an actual tree that we had in our yard and put it in the dining room. And they play with that more now than ever. I mean, it's crazy. I've got video of them. They they chase each other. And I don't even know how they do it. Some of these platforms are, are like, you know, 10 inches wide, but they just race up. They're up a ceiling level and <laughs> we'll be eating dinner. And they, they're just cats racing around. That's my life. Cats racing around my head. <laughs> but thanks for asking. Yeah, Cobra and awesome. Bubbles are doing great. We love them. Uh, Jake says from Make With Jake. Do you have any team members behind the scenes? Uh, that's a good question. We ha I've had them different times throughout the course of 14 years for different projects and different things that I'm working on. Right now, the team members behind the scenes all have to do with my online courses. But everything else, uh, as far as what I do for my channel, it's just, it's all me. I, I conceive the projects, shoot the projects and shoot the videos and edit them and post them. and read the comments and all of that. Yeah, Hillbilly Chick basically asked the same thing. How many people do you have helping with your content? Yeah, um, just me. Is, is that, are you looking to outsource anything in the future? Only if I need to. I mean, if I have a, uh, I think a lot of people have this idea that you know, you've got to set up a big team. You've got to have a team of people working for you. But I think the more important question is, well, is there really stuff that you can't do yourself? I think that my job is making videos and editing. And so that's mostly what I do. And it, it lets me have my own time frame, my own schedule. And plus editing, I and mean, I've, I've edited, I've had other editors before and I've tried them out and for different periods of time. And I always have to come back to just myself editing because I'm kind of a, a control freak that way that I I just know what I want in a video. And it's it, especially on like kind of these novelty videos, like this tape measure snapping thing that I'm doing. It's just a funny video. And I don't think I could convey that how I want that to be to somebody else without just hovering over their shoulder, you know, and telling them, don't move that, move that, do this here, cut that there. One thing I found is when I had other editors is that they, and it, it kind of drives me crazy, is that they'll be like, 
they'll end a shot like two frames longer than I would have. And it's a very minor thing, but it's just like, ah, if you could just trim that back. But I, I can't tell you to do that on every single <laughs> scene. So you just kind of have to make those compromises. But yeah, I like being a one man show. Uh, does having a large email list heavily influence your video views and therefore the YouTube algorithm? That's from no, Four Oaks Crafts. Uh, it's the other way around. Having the video views influences the the email list. The email list is huge, king. I mean, that is so important for my business. Um, it's how we market everything. And for me, since I don't do sponsorships anymore, rarely do I do them, I use my video to promote my own product. Every single time I shoot a video, I'm always reminding people to get that tool list or a couple of other these lead magnets that we have to send people to, which they get something, you know, some maybe some free plans or something in exchange for uh, their email address. And I think it's a fair exchange and it's a, allowed us to build up that email list huge. and you can't believe the power of email. I, we all think that, you know, everything's gone to DMing and, and texting, but man, email marketing is huge. Yeah. Scott Walsh from the Scott Walsh channel. Um, is authenticity on camera something that you actively think about? And how can someone work towards becoming more natural on camera? Boy, Scott, that's a really good question too, because... Mm -hmm. Authenticity is something that I strive for all the time. I always try to just be myself, but everybody always says that. They always say, well, when you're on camera, just be yourself. But as soon as the camera goes on, you're never really yourself because you're always aware of the image that you're projecting. And then you're going to refine that further when you're editing it. Um, you know, at both at best, I think most of us are only at best maybe 80 to 90 percent ourselves <laughs> there's still there's always that part that's that's carefully curated yeah so it's, and as uh, far as working to become more natural on camera that's just time just keep doing it <clears throat> the more you do it the more comfortable you get it get at it. And I, I do think it's important to, you know, as much as I'm not really a fan of saying having the avatar behind the camera, I do think it helps to imagine that you're actually talking to somebody who will be watching the video. Sometimes it's easy, easy to forget that you see numbers of people watching, but you forget that these are actual people watching your video on their phone or on their TV or wherever. And I think it's important to, to keep that in mind. I know during the pandemic, I've had more Zoom type calls at work. And one of the things I've done to try to increase my ability to do it here is whenever I'm talking on camera, instead of looking down at the screen, I try to look at that lens like I'm looking yes, right on in the like I'm right in the eye. And that allowed me to have some more practice with it. Um, and I, I'd rather do presentations in person, uh, but as part of my job, with the pandemic, I had to do more and more of these calls. And this helps me come across more genuine to them, which makes my meetings go easier. You do a great job at that. See, I think that why hasn't somebody invented something where where you can look into your screen, but the camera is is on, you know, so you'd have like eye to eye contact. I mean, I've seen some workarounds, I think like DIY perks or something had a chance had a video where, with a series of mirrors or something where you could mm -hmm. actually look the person in the eye but you just think that would be it seems like that's technology that should be here right along with like floating cars but i don't know yeah uh, the hologram image of who you're talking to <laughs> yeah. in front of your computer screen <laughs> yeah um thank you scott for that question jar made uh, jesus says have you remade an old video because you knew you can make it better? Yeah, I've made a few of those old videos over again. I think it's a valuable thing to do to revisit old projects. I think that for a while, for a long time, I always kind of was of the mindset of, well, people are going to call you out on that, that you're just like recycling old projects you don't have. But we get in this mindset that 
every video well we've seen all of our videos so everybody has seen all of those videos but the truth is those older videos nobody's watching those <laughs> they're, they're dead to me so you know it, i post a, a remake of a project that i did six seven years ago most people don't know and if and if they do maybe long time subscribers some you know somebody really watches the show a lot they actually like it they're like oh that's really cool you're revisiting the same project i remember when you did it the first time so they got a little bit of a nostalgia in there too it's steve i know we're going a little long but i have a handful more questions if that's okay sure i think i, I talked too too long no no you're doing perfect everyman build says is the mask and picture in the background Oh, prepping for here. Halloween. I can't see the Ouija board anywhere, though. So the, <laughs> I, I love the Ouija board episode because I think that was controversial. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah, I still, I, yeah. I, you know, I, I made one video because people would comment on that. I made a video where in, I had it in the background and I just kept moving it in different positions, but I didn't say anything about it. <laughs> just to, and then when people would comment about it, I would say, I don't see anything. I don't know what you're talking about. But yeah, I do love all the, the Halloween products. That's actually, uh, let me see if I can do this right. Why is this so hard? There we go. That's uh, Jason from Friday the 13th. That uh, a viewer sent me that. He drew this picture. This was during the lockdown woodworking and sent that to me. And then I made this frame for it here. It's got like a machete and, and blood dripping down. And I made that frame a few years ago for a different artwork in there. And then right here, I've got, this is a Jason mask made by Tom Savini, who did the special effects in the um, Friday the 13th movies. And these are also, these things are from viewers also who made all this neat stuff for me. I love some of your uh, Halloween videos from years past. Yeah. <laughs> you, you really had some fun with some of those. <laughs> Yeah, that's my favorite video of the year. Probably the least viewed of all of my videos are my Halloween videos, but I love making them. They're a lot of fun. Um, Lincoln Street again says, when you decided to go full time, did you ever worry about five to 10 years down the road and evolving enough to continue generating your revenue? Uh, I didn't really think about it, I guess. I, I, I just kind of knew that I could see that I was earning income on YouTube. And the biggest thing was at that time was when I was able to get some sponsors on board. And I'm like, oh, now this is kind of some real money here. Whereas the, you know, AdSense still, I always feel like everybody makes more money on AdSense than I do. But <laughs> it's, so that's like a, a minor thing. But then the sponsorships, definitely, they were really willing to pay some money. And so it was just always kind of that, trajectory moving forward. But once I, I launched my own product, then that really changed everything because then it, it just like went to that next level. And I, it's really fun that I don't have to have my audience as the product now because you, when you have sponsors on board, really your product is those eyeballs, people watching your video that you're just selling to a third party. So now I think it's really fun that I can sell my own stuff to viewers. You know, you used to have a sponsor, and I won't mention names, but you used to have a sponsor, and you did some really creative things at the beginning of each video. Micro jig, maker and, of the gripper. <laughs> <laughs> and it was one of the reasons I look forward to your videos, see yeah. how you would be creative in bringing that subject up. Oh, man, um, I love doing those things. They were so fun. And a lot of people think that there was like, oh, we, we had like a – disagreement or something why we didn't but it was actually my decision to stop doing those micro jig loved them and i love doing them and i'm still a real fan of micro jig and we talk to them they send me christmas presents every year which is really nice but um it was it was kind of damaging my channel a little bit to have that on the very first time and it's funny that you mentioned that because what would happen is a lot of people would tune into my videos just for that and as soon as that little bit was done they would leave the video and so there it was really having a dramatic effect on my channel but the final thing was when i wanted to promote my own products then it became a conflict there it's like well i don't people don't like it when you are constantly plugging something it's like okay i plug micro jig here and then i've got 
it's, you know, some other sponsor in the video. And then I'm going to try to sell you my own product. <laughs> that doesn't go over very well. So it was just kind of the right time to end that. But man, those were fun. There's actually a video. Somebody did a, a like a super cut of all of those that I did on, on YouTube. You can look that up. It was really funny. I'll have to look that up. I, I enjoyed them. I was not one of those people that uh, logged off after watching the ad. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, that those were those were fun though. Uh, Sandy from McKenzie Lumber Mill says, "What are some income streams you would suggest?" I guess for uh, other YouTubers. I uh, I would say probably the best. That they, well, I mean, sponsorship deals usually pay pretty well as long as you can provide the views. Those are getting trickier and trickier to do these days um but i think a lot an easy entry point is just to sell plans if you can design projects and sell plans i think that uh, a lot of people do really well on it you know matthias wandel he does really well on, on plans it's basically like most of his income is selling those plans yeah i uh, i really enjoyed your interview with him and the topics you you covered um, anybody who hasn't seen that uh, definitely they should they should go watch all your podcasts but <laughs> uh, definitely should go listen to that one I found it uh, extremely informative and entertaining he's like one of the most keyed into YouTube guys around you know he's not he's not like one of these YouTube gurus because he just has but he knows everything about YouTube and he's really into keeping track of analytics and other channels and how everything is going kind of like the general feel of YouTube. All right. Scott Walsh says, what's your process for generating new ideas for content? Well, I keep a list on my phone of any idea that comes into my head, any time, any place. And then I just jot it down. I use just Google keep. And I just keep a list of ideas and then I just, I go through that list periodically and just kind of think, how would that, is there anything here I can expand on? And, but the funny thing is, even though I have that list, a lot of times I come up with an idea, probably most of the times I just come up with an idea that's not on that list because it just might be something that's current that I just want to explore. But I, I really don't know how, I don't know how any of it comes to be. <laughs> it's all magic. Awesome. So, whoops, let me catch up here. Woodcraft by Simon says, if you don't mind sharing, what proportions of your business is AdSense, affiliate, sponsors, and product course sales? Uh, AdSense is maybe 5 to 10%, and affiliate sales a little bit less. I don't even, you know, I don't focus on affiliate sales too much sponsors zero now and product and course sales it's <laughs> the rest oh and there's some patreon thrown in there and uh, some other odds and ends but that's pretty much the breakdown I, I really focus on selling those courses yeah fantastic and justin from justin woodworks is a uh, young man and he has a new youtube channel and he says, what I'm writing this down, Justin's Woodworks. Justin's I literally do keep a track of all channels that I find. Yeah. Uh, what tips do you have for getting your first 1,000 subscribers? Um, uh, prob the, that's always a tough one. I think that the main thing is probably the same advice that everybody gives you is just, just publish a, a crap ton of content as much as you can try to keep on a regular schedule all that stuff really helps the youtube algorithm if you could post you know at least a video a week that's probably the best thing you can do and make make the videos interesting and fun have a reason for people to watch them i think that there's just a lot of saturation on youtube in this space right now it's really hard to get started Probably the, the second thing I would tell you to do is, you know, start it 14 years ago. It would be a lot easier than it is now. Yeah. Well, that's, a, that's not an option anymore. That's a tough one. Yeah, <laughs> I, just, I was kind of lucky at that time. Yeah. Well, Steve, you are a, um, a, a 
foundation to this woodworking community and we i'm speaking for everybody because i know they would agree with me oh, thank i appreciate you. everything you've done over the last 14 years and i personally appreciate your graciousness in accepting the invitation to come on the live stream um where can they find you other than your youtube channel um everything's on there really yeah just head over to youtube channel i'm fine with that you'll find there if you if you prowl around you'll find me on instagram and and all the others and rt thank you for having me on here i, I really appreciate it it was really nice meeting you and i think this is a, a really fun thing you're doing i i like this the concept of of just having a live stream talking to other youtube woodworkers it's very cool it is been a blast for me the last three months and i continue to enjoy it and it's because of great people like you does it, right. does it get you stressed out every week there's prep work every yeah. week um, my stress level is different every week depending on what i have going on the weekend yeah. and how busy work is uh, to make sure i have enough time to to do the prep and make sure everything is lined up and you know, I test the equipment before I come online and, you know, so oh, if, the, if the boss says I need to work late, then I'm going to be pushing it on time. I get, and I've, I've tried I've to do, some, I've tried to do live streams several times and I get, I get so stressful on him. I was like, I don't know how to talk on a live stream like that. <laughs> I need to edit. You do a great job. Good right. for you. you. You don't, you did great tonight and you've done great on the, the other shows I've seen you on. So. But yeah, I really like your edited uh, streams. All right, guys, I, I see a couple of uh, people sneaking in questions here. And uh, Steve, I'm going to bug you again. So 4321 says, Steve keeps track of all the channels. <laughs> I do. Weird to think well, that I'm Steve gonna... Ramsey may have been to my little channel. <laughs> if I haven't, I'm going to check it out right after this. I definitely will. Um, yeah. I should, I, I should ask you to keep a list send me over a list every week of anything i don't know about because I'll, I'll add i i it's huge i you can't believe how many channels I, I have on there and so it's always fun i love looking at channels who are just starting you know have like two subscribers or something i think it's really fun to see what they're up to mm -hmm. a stalker um, <laughs> rh charlie guy says can the uh, woodworking talk show go live yeah I've thought about it. it it's again, I, it just makes me too nervous. <laughs> I just, I, I like the control of like, I'm going to record this and, and edit it and, and get rid of my weird ticks and stuff. <laughs> well, Steve, thank you again. I do appreciate you, sir. And I wish You're you welcome. to have a great night. All right, I hear too. my wife calling. I got to go. <laughs>